or if you were if you were Lutheran uh, or a Protestant, then you could be you know get into trouble with the with the local priest. Sometimes people would kind of show their expression. The women would, would uh, kind of show their own resistance. So let's say let's say you're a Lutheran woman in a Catholic town, and along and so the feast is the feast of Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi is a feast that is held in June. Uh, it's held uh, sort of like a week and a half after Pentecost. And uh, the host, that is the bread, that is the body of Christ, is carried through the town in a procession. Now, I've been in Italy hearing that kind of it's been an amazing thing. Uh, there are the carried in procession, and then uh, the people kneel as it goes by because in Catholic teaching it is the body of Christ. Lutheran teaching, it also is, but for Lutherans, um, it's up to you whether you kneel. Okay, so the priest makes him kneel. <laughs> it's okay to kneel, but you don't need to force it. So <laughs> it is the body of Christ, but but then the Lutherans sort of resist the carrying it around in procession. All right, it's, it's for eating, for the forgiveness of sins, not the carrying around in procession. Now, interestingly, this is a digression. I don't want this about the Thirty Years' War, but I was in Italy one time. Uh, feast of Corpus Christi, and my Italian isn't that good, but I think I understood the gist of the sermon. So it was, it, it was a few days before Corpus Christi, there's a feast of St. Anthony right there. Anthony's the patron saint of giving bread. He's also the one who, uh, Anthony, Anthony, please come round, something is lost that must be found, the mm -hmm. patron of lost objects there. Lutheran perspective. Um, Lutherans have an agnosticism about the prayer life. Protestant wives 
crazy and not very funny. So it's like a yo-yo for the people, that's what they do. And, and, and like I said, you could be uh, devout Catholic, hide your rosary. So this is, a, this is a little bit of a problem there. So, but, and then there's an additional problem. So the, whoever's region it was, that person's religion, usually his, it's we, whoever, it's his, her, it's, uh, but only two options were available. You could either be Catholic, or you could be Lutheran. Those were the only two options. And I don't know if Pastor Carl talked about this, but there were other strands of Protestantism on the continent at this time. There was what we call Reformed. Some people who might, uh, so the, basically the, the spiritual ancestors of the Presbyterians and the Fourth Church in America, the, United, uh, the UCC, uh, and some of those. And those people were less inclined to talk about bread being the body of Christ. Some even said it's not, no way is it the body of Christ, it's just bread, symbolically even. There are others who said it's bread, but when we eat it, we are, our hearts are taken up and we commune with Christ. There, there are different versions of reformed. But the reformed didn't have that option. So if you were reformed and you were a prince, what were you likely to do? Which one do you pick? Well, the Protestant. You choose the Lutheran one but it's way better than Catholic from a reformed position. So we had some of those, we had that going on. And that was maybe one of the biggest contentions, that you could be, that Calvinist uh, reform was not really an option there. Um, so, uh, and then a number of them were, and so like <laughs> Calvinist reform, they're way more Protestant than Lutheran was. So I'm married to a Presbyterian, I think there are different kinds of different views within Lutheranism or different kind of modes, but in many ways, Lutherans more resemble Catholics than do Presbyterian us in certain ways, with the exception of popes and bishops. But just about everything else, we're pretty, we're very close, not identical. So there's a great amount of dissatisfaction uh, going through the years, and then Assembly of the empire. So you've got an emperor, but then you've got a, the legislative body, the diet, the assembly. Uh, all of the princes have a vote. Uh, they're present. Also present are mayors of free cities, that is, cities that aren't accountable to the prince in a particular way, uh, and so forth. Are yes. We, are we just talking Germany? Are we talking France? Or we are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So what we're talking about is what's called the Holy Roman Empire. So the cool 
Charles V is the emperor. Later on, he abdicates eventually. Um, he, he wants to just retire and have a quiet life, which is very hard when you're emperor. Yeah. <laughs> so at one point, the, the princes who were Protestant boycotted the imperial diet because they said, this, you don't represent us. You, you are not, you're not respecting the, the Calvinists. And, and then in 1609,
territory, what do they do in addition to just occupying the territory? They kill it, they kill the stuff. So if you've got a big army, they're going to go to the barn and eat all the food, slaughter the cattle, uh, if there's any wine in local cabin. So in other words, there is, there's, if you've got a very heavy military presence, uh, then the, then Albert, the general, doesn't have to support them. They're just eating off of the land, off of them, the people first there. Uh, uh, so that's, but this terrible 30 years of war was incredibly devastating. During this time, Germany, what's now Germany, which has a big chunk of the Holy Roman Empire, lost one third of its population. Uh, Warfare, starvation, and disease. So there were, I don't know the exact numbers, but there were seven to eight million fewer people in 1648 than in 1618. So that was really amazing. Two fifths of the world population was gone. Some of them because of starvation and disease or casualty of war. Uh, others because they fled in their cities so they could be surrounded by the walls. So terrible destruction. And there's also a terrible destruction of property and records. A lot of times, uh, like historians will say, we need to look that up. Well, the records were lost during the Thirty Years' War because of kind of casualties there. Now, into the scene came, entered a Protestant hero, Gustavus Adolphus. And I've got a picture of him there for you. Look at look at the pointy ears. And there he is, also on a on a horse that looks a little bit disproportionate. Yeah, but then you're 
you're also covered with musket fire. So you use kind of old school and new school together strategically. Musket at that time, it took you a while to reload. So you couldn't uh, we'll get to that. Well, yeah, but here's, here's a, a couple of things that he did. He uh, developed um, something called the salvo. No one had done this before. Simultaneous firing of weapons, which creates a thunderous sound, which places the enemy at a psychological disadvantage. So if all your musket spin cannons and all that go off all at once, and you're going to freak out the enemy, especially in the 1600s, where it's still kind of new technology then. Um, also, he uh, did something that, as far as we know, hadn't really been done, and that's coming up with this. You've got musket fire, you have maybe three ranks. So one in front, one in the middle, one in the back. Now, if you're in the front, you're going to need a lot of wax for your ears. But what you do is sort of on command, well trained, first rank fires, drops to their knees. Second rank fires, drops to their knees. Third rank, uh, third, uh, uh, rank fires, they don't need to drop because the first one is up ready to shoot. So you can do a continuous kind of military um, barrage.
Protestants had tried prayer services and seemed not to have helped sufficiently <laughs> there. And so here, here's Dr. Lutz talking here. I really think we should go bigger. I seek not my own advantage in this war, nor any gain, save the security of my kingdom. I can look for nothing but expense, hard work, trouble, and danger to hide from them. So he's saying, I'm doing it to kind of create a plot zone to protect my to protect my kingdom. Oh, yeah. So I'm doing this for you. Uh, now he's actually a little bit prophetic too, because what happens is that there is a fateful day in November 16. Oh, actually, let me let me uh, read the last part of this letter here since we're on to the first side, which is Dr. Lutz talking. I tell you plainly that I will no more hear anything of neutrality. His excellency must be either friend or foe. This is when the liberator says he's got to side with us. Um, when I reached his frontier, he must either declare himself either hot or cold. It's in the book of Revelation, right? You either have God's side or not. Um, the fight is between God and the devil. If his excellency is on God's side, let him stand by me. He holds rather with the devil, but he must fight with me. There is no third course. That is first. And that came with an edge. Like, if you're not going to support Fighting, but the Protestants are starting. 
calls and interest were permitted. So that was a, a, little, a little bit more free choice, but not free, free choice. Uh, Anabaptists have been shutting down the people who believe that you should be baptized as adults. They continue to be persecuted. So th there were only three options. Is that Catholic, the Amish? like the Amish. Yes. Yeah. So the Anabaptists are not Baptists, but like people like the Amish who are um, generally pacifists and so forth. But the political boundaries at this point remain essentially the same until the time of Napoleon, and the religious boundaries lasted into the 20th century. And so this map here, this comes from Pastor Carl, he sent it to me, and I thought I'll print it out so you've got it. So you see this little one down below, this is like a general outline Roman Catholic, what's Eastern Orthodox, what's Muslim would be, uh, uh, what's Islam, uh, Muslim is green. In 16, in 1560, so you had little pockets of Anabaptists, um, the Anglican Church of England, Calvinist, the Calvinists um, basically uh, were in places like Holland, some parts of Germany, uh, some of the German uh, Germanic uh, lands and some uh, sort of beleaguered, persecuted parts of France. Uh, and then you've got Lutheran, Lutheran, you see Lutheran goes north, Calvinist is more south, and Catholics are south. And that's what you ended up with at the end of the Thirty Years' War. Pause there for a even if we are 
was raised uh, that way was not. He was permitted to attend a prom, but, uh, but he was only allowed to go as an observer only, not actually dance. My mother went to Luther College, a Norwegian immigrant founded school. And when she was there in the late 50s, early 60s, no dancing was permitted. You could even be expelled for dancing one county over at the dance hall there. Um, now in women's physical education classes, uh, square dancing was just what you used to do. I don't know if they do that now. I know when I was growing up, square you know, it's like you play volleyball and you do square. That's the best. <laughs> That's about it. Um, but so what you do, they call them square games. So you still do 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 and swing your partner around and around, promenade, you know, <laughs> <laughs> promenade, all that kind of stuff. But uh, but they call them square games. So I guess this is okay. So <laughs> anyway. My, my father, though, went to a more Germanic seminary, Luther's, uh, Wartburg Seminary, which is actually very similar to what was Capital Seminary, uh, Trinity's predecessor, so it's kind of in the same wavelength, that was very concerned that if you emphasize this too much, then people will think it's your own works that they're going to get you into heaven. So my dad kind of learned a theology of justification by grace through faith without emphasizing too much of the work. So, uh, well, this is what he did once a year. He would buy a bottle of wine once a year, and he would sip it slowly over the course of about two weeks. So he drinks about that much. He'd make sure his daughter saw him drink. He used to offer at least a glass of wine to sip. And I'm convinced he did that for our, our own souls so that we would not think that by abstaining from alcohol, we would um, earn our way into heaven because
through expositions of the art here. And so we, we, this is something that we are, are bound to, maybe not every single stop and tool, but the, but the three to four principles about word and fabric have come to the end of our time. <laughs> Go. But I thank you so much for being here.